All right, hello again, everybody. Um, Deborah, do you want to get us started? Sure, thank you. And welcome everyone to BusinessWise Insiders. I'm Deborah Klein, president and co founder of BusinessWise. For those of you that have joined us before in Atlanta or Dallas, Fort Worth, or Charlotte, the agenda is going to change slightly today because of the virtual nature of our program. So rather than introductions first, we are going to cover our prepared content and then move to Zoom breakout sessions where we can meet each other and discuss the content or related cold calling issues in today's ever-changing environment. As always, our hope is that you will gain ideas to put into practice right away and you're encouraged to share with and practice with your teams or others that you may meet today and establish further connections outside of today's program. Many of you subscribe to Bus the BusinessWise database tool currently, and I thank you for that, to help you identify and connect your best prospects by phone or email, perhaps postal mail, and of course, formerly in person. This month marks the 40th anniversary for BusinessWise. And while the current challenges are unique, I've been around long enough to know there will be better times ahead. And we all need to work at creating our own good luck. So to that end, for those of you who do not believe in cold calling your target market, I doubt today's session will change your mind. Anyone who never makes a cold call ultimately proves that cold calling will not work. For the rest of us, since making cold calls is difficult and does not always yield the results we want, utilizing best practices and a focus on all that improves our chance of creating meaningful connections is what we'll focus on today. So to get started, let me turn things over to my colleague, Sam Mitchell, our direct marketing guru. Take it away, Sam. Thank you, Deborah, and welcome again, everyone, to the first virtual session of BusinessWise Insiders. Uh, given the large number of attendees and to keep things moving, <clears throat> we're going to be keeping everyone on mute while I walk through today's presentation. Uh, but of course, the idea behind Insiders is to ensure that participants can meet and learn from each other. So at the end of the presentation, we'll split into breakout rooms where you'll have the chance to introduce yourself, ask questions, and offer your own insights. If you do have a question during the presentation, either write it down or feel free to ask it in the chat window. Then during the breakout sessions, we'll try and discuss as many of those as possible. And I'll try to keep things moving at a steady pace so we can spend as little time listening to me talk and more time engaging with each other. Uh, with that, let's get started. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about how to dial up more appointments using six cold call scripts for the COVID-19 economy. And I wanted to talk a little bit first just about what cold calling in a COVID-19 world looks like. Um, these days, cold calling, as you've probably experienced yourself, is especially tough. So much has changed both for you and your prospects, and cold calling without a roadmap can feel risky. Uh, just some of the additional stresses uh, that COVID-19 has imposed on us are that fewer inbound leads, both for you and your prospects, is putting more pressure on you and your, and, and your prospects. Uh, prospects may be overstressed and overscheduled, which requires more empathy and a lighter touch. Um, what businesses offered before COVID may be irrelevant or outdated in today's environment, so it requires a changing strategy. And then with no in-person appointment to set, it raises the question of, what are the goals and next steps of a cold call? Um, so it's always been the case in, in our firm belief that you don't need a rigid cold call script uh, when you're calling. Um, as you can see here, the, pro the cold caller on the left has a fairly rigid script and the prospect on the right um, reacts with a firm no. Um, and the reason you don't need a rigid script is because cold calling shouldn't be about what you're saying, it should be about getting your prospect to talk so that you can listen and respond. And this is especially true in the COVID-19 world where 
each business's experience is vastly different and where increased stress has made it even more important to be sensitive to what your prospect is saying and feeling. On the other hand, uh, the words you use still matter, obviously, and that's why we've developed a series of short, flexible scripts that you can use to navigate the various phases of every cold call and to maximize the chances of a positive outcome for both you and your prospect. And so what you see on the screen is sort of six uh, different colored boxes indicating six phases of a cold call, and we'll use those to sort of guide us through the presentation from leave a message to still not sure. And that brings us to our first script, which we call the voicemail email combo. And you might be wondering why we're starting with voicemail when we're talking about cold calling scripts. Um, and that's because, as many of you have probably experienced, uh, a vast majority, up to 80% of all calls go to voicemail. So it's critical to have a voicemail strategy that includes a well-rehearsed message and a plan for follow-up. Um, this voicemail may not seem incredibly special, but the point of it is to be clear um, and to set up follow-up with an email. So you have prospect name. This is Deborah Klein with BusinessWise. I'm sorry I missed you. I'm calling to set up a time to speak with you, so I'll follow up with an email with more details. Thank you. And then the next step is the email follow through. And the idea here is to obviously reach your prospects through a different channel, one that you've already prompted with your voicemail, um, and to include a few critical pieces of information. Uh, the first is to be clear about your solution to your prospect's problem. So for business-wise, um, as Deborah mentioned, we offer a database that helps salespeople connect with their prospects in their local market. Our solution might be how to fill your prospecting pipeline with local sales opportunities. You also wanna be sure to emphasize that you're solving your prospect's pain. For example, capturing lost revenue or improving business reentry or ensuring your business can weather the storm. Um, and then finally, a couple of other ideas for things to include in your email. One is a brief to the point description of what your company offers, particularly as it, rates, as it relates to the current economic climate. So for example, again, with BusinessWise, you might say BusinessWise helps our clients identify and reach their target market virtually by phone and by email. Uh, you may also want to offer information that might be helpful to your prospects. For example, here at BusinessWise, we'll include firmographic information about companies in their local market. Um, or a link to a landing page where they can discover additional content or fill out a survey that provides information that we can use to learn more about them. And that brings us to why this works. Again, being clear, concise, and direct gives you your best odds of a response. When you offer something of value, you convey empathy to your prospects and you increase the odds of reciprocity, which is your prospect giving something back to you. And by both calling and emailing, you give your prospect multiple opportunities and ways to respond. And Deborah, I don't know if you had any additional thoughts on this section before we move on to the next script. So I know for people that don't have that don't have um, email addresses, it makes the one-two punch of a voicemail and an email difficult. It is really valuable to know your prospect's email address before you call because, as Sam mentioned, the likelihood of you getting voicemail is very high. So, um, and if you don't have a prepared email already to quickly send, you're probably not gonna do it because you're not gonna to wanna to spend the time composing an email that's different for every person. So that additional preparation in advance to your cold calling is gonna make a huge difference. Thanks, Deborah. And that brings us to our second script, which we call the double handshake. And it's something we've been using at BusinessWise. For a number of years. And this is the first script we recommend using when your prospect actually answers your call. We call it the double handshake because it's sort of a two-pronged introduction. 
where the first prong is to establish that you haven't met and to ask permission to continue speaking. So you have the caller on the left saying, hello, I'm first and last name. We haven't met, but do you have a moment to speak with me? If you get a yes, then that's all you need. You can dive right into the phone call. But if your prospect says no, then you move on to the second prong, which is to ask if there's a better time today for you to connect. So, okay, thanks. Is there a better time today? We can talk. And why this works is that your goal for your cold call should be twofold, to obtain permission and to reduce friction. So the reason for asking permission is that when your prospect opens the door to the conversation, it's much more likely to be congenial. This has always been really important, but for some of the reasons we've already mentioned, it's especially critical at the current moment. And then the reason for establishing that you haven't met is to remove any potential friction that might stand in the way of a conversation. You want your prospect to focus on and respond to what you're saying and not be distracted trying to remember whether they know you or your company. And then finally, the second prong of the double handshake where you ask, is there another time today, applies gentle pressure on your prospect and conveys a sense of urgency which makes it a little bit harder for him or her to brush you off. And often your prospect will just agree to talk now rather than trying to find time later that day. Deborah, did you wanna talk about this at all before we moved on? Um, the double handshake works really well and it will seem very odd to you before you begin it. But when you, tell the person right away that we haven't met, they're not gonna spend time going through their mental contact list and not listen to the other things that you're trying to say. So I encourage you to do it. It's gonna feel odd at the beginning, but just like when you think about shaking someone's hand, and you're gonna to have to think about it because it's gonna be a long time before you actually do it again. But you know when you shake someone's hand and you get that second little shake, you know, you, the first shake and then the second shake that sort of says, yes, I want to talk to you. That's exactly what we're doing on the phone. And it works. Thanks, Ed. So for our third script, we get to the, the entree of the phone call, the meat and potatoes. When we use the acronym TRIC, T-R-I-C, which stands for the reason I'm calling. And at this point in the call, your prospect is starting to wonder what you're calling about and what you want from him or her. And the idea behind TRIC is, again, twofold. Number one is to help you remember to be direct and get to the point. So when you prompt that first substantive sentence with the reason I'm calling, uh, it, it's a great mnemonic device to remember that that you need to get right to the point and not waste your prospect's time. And then the second purpose is to ensure that your call has a purpose that both you and your prospect are clear on. So you see on the screen on the left, it's the reason I'm calling and there are a couple of options in the middle, learn more about, to set a time to meet, to show you some ideas about, and then to transition quickly into asking whether they have their calendar in front of them. And this may seem a little blunt, but your goal here is to get your prospect to respond to you with some questions that you can then answer and that they'll be more likely to hear and listen to. So don't, wait, don't waste time, get to the point. Direct approach is one that's professional and respectful. And then crafting a clear what we do statement to respond to your prospects inevitable questions. So a couple of tips. One is to brainstorm with your colleagues about what the reason for your call is. So as an organization, um, deciding what you want that primary purpose of each cold call to be. What is your goal? To set an appointment, to discover if there's a reason to connect, to offer something of value. And then remember at the cold call stage, you have to assume your prospect isn't close to thinking about buying. So ask yourself, what do they get from a meeting with you even if they don't buy something? Why should they give you their valuable time? And then you can use the answers to those questions to create a compelling reason for your call. And then when your prospect inevitably asks who are you or what this is about, they'll be more likely to listen to your answer. So you'll need to be ready with something that's clear, concise, and unique, and that speaks to your prospects' challenges and priorities. So here's just an example of what we might say here at BusinessWise. If a prospect asks us, what do we do? Shortened to the point, I'm with BusinessWise. We help B2B sales professionals with concerns over the number of qualified leads in their pipeline, confusion about how to gain more first-time appointments with local decision makers, 
frustration on how to capture lost revenue. And using these pain words like concerns, confusion, frustration helps bring the focus to your prospects, problems, and challenges. And then a reminder that your pre-COVID value proposition may be irrelevant or outdated now. So make sure that the reason I'm calling is to help your prospect in today's economy. So maybe think about how your product or service supports remote work or management. Anything you want to add, Deb? I, th I think it's very clear. The most important thing is that pre-work to really be focusing on your prospect. Of course, it's easy to get focused on what we have and how great it is and the value of it and how so many pro people like that prospect utilize our services and none of that matters at this point. So you really wanna be focused on where that person is and they're probably fearful, they're probably concerned and they really don't care about your products and services right now. So that's the important connection that you have to make. All right, and that brings us to our fourth script, which we sort of put under the umbrella of let me ask you something. And the idea here is you're likely to reach a stage in most cold calls where your prospect starts to resist a little bit, where it's hard to get them to open up and where they're trying to brush you off. And when your prospect resists opening up, using questions can help you drive the conversation, steer it in the direction you want, but also bring the focus back to them and uncover unresolved pain and unmet priorities. So here you have a series of five different ideas for questions that you could ask to steer the conversation in certain directions. How are you coping these days? Are you able to look toward the future? Have you transitioned to working from home? How has that changed your approach? And each of these questions is tailored to a specific situation. For example, if your prospect makes it seem like everything is going great, in spite of the circumstances, you could ask something like question number three, can you share some of the details of what you're doing so I can understand what's working so well? Um, and then more open-ended questions like, typically when I speak with people like you, they're worried about common problem. Are you ever concerned about that? Or if you could change just one thing about your approach, what would it be? And the answers to these questions, whatever they say, will give you another opportunity to dig a little deeper and, and uncover potential pain. And then if your prospect continues to stonewall, a good, very open-ended question might be, can you think of any way I can be helpful to you? And why this works is, again, your prospect is likely to resist, so being prepared with sort of prepackaged questions like this is a good strategy. It helps keep, keep the conversation moving even when your prospect tries to stall it, uh, and it shifts the focus back to what your prospect cares about, which is critical. And then, of course, when your prospect is talking, that equals more engagement and interest um, than if you are talking and they're listening. We always talk about the 70-30 rule, which is our rule of thumb, where you aim to spend at least 70% of your time listening and no more than 30% talking. And then some tips for proving you're listening um, when, you're, when your prospect is talking is to sort of key off their answers and ask bridging questions based on what they say. So use your prospect's answer to ask a clarifying question that steers the conversation toward how you can help, for example. So you're not interested because problem or priority isn't a top priority right now. You mentioned X, tell me more about that. Or based on what you're telling me, X is a problem. How has that been affecting you? Deb, did you have anything to add? It's really amazing how much time most of us spent it up spend at our companies on knowing how to present our products and services knowing everything about them how it compares to the competition etc cetera, etc cetera. most of us spend very little time on how to get that first appointment and probably less time practicing um, i am a big believer in practicing this stuff and I can't encourage you enough to practice what you're going to say when your prospects object because they will. No, no, if any of your prospect was that interested in talking to you, they would be calling you 
you wouldn't have to call them. So this part of the process is extraordinarily important. And just because we've all been teenagers doesn't mean we're good on the phone. So practice. All right, so moving on to our fifth script. Our recommendation is to always focus on selling the appointment and not your product. So when you've uncovered your prospect's pain and you feel like you have a moment to move the conversation toward prompting an appointment, you could say something like, that's exactly why I called. Our clients experience a lot of the same dilemmas and obstacles, and when we meet, we can look at potential solutions. You may never become a customer, but you'll gain some good ideas either way. And the idea here is that you don't want your prospect to feel like there are any strings attached to the meeting or that the purpose of the meeting is for you to get something out of them. Because really it's not, it's for you to mutually determine whether you might be a good fit for each other. So selling the appointment is a two-way street where everyone can benefit, even if they never become a client, is both an effective strategy and the right step toward a potentially closer relationship. And some of the reasons why it works is, number one, you're not going to close a complex B2B sale with a cold call anyway, so you should really be focusing on climbing the ladder and aiming for that next small step rather than the final step. And then again, talking about reciprocity, when you give or offer free ideas, you increase the likelihood that you get something back from your prospect. And then all of this raises the question that I talked about at the beginning, which is with in-person meetings sort of off the table at this point, what is the next step with a cold call? And the idea here, here is that a cold call is not the appropriate forum to have a more in-depth discussion about problems and solutions. It's more about qualifying whether the prospect is potentially a good fit. So and I, a good idea for when you get to this stage is to offer a choice between another longer phone appointment or a Zoom video meeting, which is obviously a little bit close to face, closer to a face-to-face -face meeting and more preferable. And then again, emphasizing <clears throat> that there are no strings attached and that the idea is to determine whether you're a good fit for each other. Deb, did you have anything? Well, I didn't, but since you asked, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm just curious at this point, and we're going to talk more about it in the, um, in our breakout sessions, but, uh, wave your wave your hand if um if this absolutely does not make sense to you all right and that brings us to our final script which we've dubbed the last resort and this is for scenarios where your prospect just continues to push you off at every attempt to even sell the appointment, to dig into their pain points with questions, they continue to resist. Um, in the pre-COVID world, we, we would have advised using something like the 369 question. I've included it here because I think it puts a fine point on the concept. Your prospects still won't budge. You might say something like, okay, I understand you don't want to meet right now, so let me ask you 36 or 9. When your prospect says, what do you mean, or I don't understand, you can say, when should I follow up in 36 or 9? It's sort of a lighthearted way to keep the conversation going or to secure an agreement for you to follow up at a later date with the idea being to let your prospect to define the time frame for follow-up. So three days, six days, nine months. But in the current climate, another option <clears throat> might be to be a little gentler and direct and say something like, apparently I can't help you at the moment, but th since things keep changing quickly, I'd like to stay in touch and I don't want to bother you. When do you suggest I connect with you again? And there's a couple of reasons why this works and presents an effective opportunity. Um, obviously one last chance to keep the conversation moving. Um, you can always ask what might change between now and then. That's a good way to sort of restart uh, your effort to dig a little bit deeper into your prospect's pain. And then again, obviously letting your prospect define the time frame, sort of similar to asking permission at the beginning of a call when he or she sets the terms, the engagement is likely to be more congenial 
and productive. Um, and it's important to note that this kind of last resort question is only for qualified prospects. You obviously won't want to follow up with a prospect you determine is not a good fit for you during the course of the call. And that brings us to the end of the presentation. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a moment and my colleague will assign everybody into breakout rooms. I just wanna note that the default setting for breakout rooms is that everybody will be able to unmute themselves freely. <clears throat> so please keep yourself muted at the beginning so that uh, our Wise Guys team member from our local market who will be in your breakout room can identify themselves. And then we will follow up uh, at the end of this meeting with an email um, with a link to the presentation slides, as well as to our LinkedIn insiders group, which you can join to access the slides. Um, and then finally, I believe I've set the breakout rooms to end at 1030, but that should give everybody plenty of time um, to discuss today's topic. But thank you again. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can start the breakout sessions.